Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We take from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the authors. We know you want actions, not theories, and it's actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about, helping you to become a wicked company. Well, Marcus, I know you don't like to hear about it, but I did just get back from three weeks in Portugal, and I know we have a lot to get caught up on, so who are we talking to today? Yeah, and you actually extended it by a week and were happy to tell me about it. Yeah, well, um, good to have you back, Troy. Uh, apart from the fact we recorded one out of out from Portugal, which was quite fun to do. Well, today we have uh, Greg Githens, and he wrote a book called How to Think Strategically. And he talked to us a lot about the role of strategy in organizations and that it is actually a very individual capability and should be more brought out as an individual capability, shouldn't just stick around with strategists themselves, but should be a, um, ever present in lots of other parts of an organization, which I, to some extent, agree with. So, um, but enough about me. What were your takeaways from the interview? I think uh, a couple of things. One, he talks about how to think strategically requiring a number of skills or competences. And one of which is kind of listening to the weak signals and then doing sense making from those. But he also breaks them down into how he classifies his 20 different micro skills. I think if you look at each one of those, they are indeed micro skills. And if this book is targeted, as he says it is, at individuals and helping individuals build the competence of thinking strategically, it gives them kind of, okay, first work on this and then work on this and then and then work on something else. And I thought that was really good. And he has a couple of nice frameworks on how to write strategy that kind of keeps you um, from going off on wild tangents and winding up with 200 page PowerPoints. So I thought, I thought both of those are pretty good. Yeah, I think um, that works for, works for me as well, because I think one of my big takeaways is the fact that um, strategy is not the only competency that you have to atomize and apply to. If you want to build let's call them wicked teams or future teams that are nimble, resilient enough to create their own insights, make their own decisions, to move forward quickly and experiment, then you need a bunch of new skills. Some of them uh, are strategy, but others that I've been familiar with, let's say working at BT or other projects, you know, it's not just agile, like new ways of working, but for example, you might have to go into business, uh, business case building, right? So you have to learn those aspects of how to make a point and how to build up the numbers. On top of that, you have to learn how to create new types of measurements. So those are a couple of skills where you go, well, it's not just quantitative anymore, it's qualitative as well, you know. Then you get into the area of design thinking and customer centricity and how to do human-centered research to get the insights. So there's a ton of that stuff that needs to not just sit in one department, in one bunker, not just in a horizontal silo, what actually needs to sit in a lot of different strategic, may I say so, no pun intended, aspects of the organization. So every team should have, either should have competencies in the team or should have them available at their fingertips, right? Because again, it's one thing that we did over at BT. It's something we also, I think, to some extent had over at Nationwide when when I worked on on some programs is that we didn't have a finance person sitting in there. So the business casing was quite tricky because we had mainly um, developers working in it who also didn't have design skills. But we docked on those skills whenever they were needed and a single resource helped the rest of the team to build up certain insights, to make certain cases, to produce certain assets and so on. And I think that's sort of where I think this will go. There's a bigger book of that uh, around exactly that, which is called The Future of Professions, and I'm really eager to get the author or any of the two authors in. Uh, and they talk a lot about how professions themselves are breaking down and how they're being atomized and how they're reforming and reshaping. And I think that needs to happen in an organization. Again, all I'm probably saying is that break down the silos, think horizontal, have multidisciplinary teams, or have teams that can 
take multiple disciplines in whenever they need to. So that for me is sort of where his book does it for strategy. And I think organizations need to consider a lot of different capabilities on top of that, that do the same thing or distribute it and appear in the same way. Yeah, and I think that the last time you used the word strategy was the 163rd time that we used it in this particular podcast. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. just to tie tie things together across what you were just saying there, I mean, we've had the, the privilege of doing 10 recordings, 11 recordings so far, and there, yeah, are, well, these, to, yeah. there are common themes. I mean, the, the idea of the rational individual as from a decision-making perspective, whether it's a strategist inside a company or whether it's a consumer, doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, his point exactly. was that people are making decisions that are not necessarily in their best interest, uh, either because of bias or because of short-term thinking or, or a variety of other kind of deeply understood psychological kind of issues. Um, and the other one is the, the small bets thing. I mean, we deal with digital transformation. We deal with innovation, which is all about small bets. So whether it's strategy small bets or strategic innovative small bets, the idea is companies will indeed benefit from making many, many, many small bets and being prepared to walk away from the ones that don't work and learn from them, and then hoping that over time, on the aggregate, they find the few that do. Or, as some people say, be tactical, right? Tactical as the smaller step of strategy, which I think a lot of people are mixing up with just building workarounds for the thing you actually should be building, but it's a different story. The other thing, like... Going back to your first point, definitely, I mean, you know, we had Richard Chataway here who talked about behavioral science and he went through all sorts of biases that they look at. And the really interesting part, for example, was that he said leadership should communicate that they have biases, that they, whatever they say is under a particular viewpoint and it doesn't represent the full breadth of reality, right? So the other thing is... Uh, uh, when I think of Richard Chataway's episode, who does behavioral science, and he talked about a whole range of biases that people have. And one, one point he made was that maybe it's time that leadership stops making decisions and just clearly communicates that they are having biases themselves, often heavy leaning towards business instead of customer capabilities, right? So that is a thing that needs to be recognized, I think. And, you know, and that also goes to the, 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 the old sentence that I, for some reason, try to remember as, as, as um, reality eats strategy for breakfast. But I think I remember it's actually culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, I think. I don't I know. I think you're right. I think I'm right. Am I? Yeah, see, I'm. Um, but before we babble on longer, Shall we go to the interview? Yeah, let's go to the interview. Okay. Hello, everyone. So today we have Greg Gittens. Sorry, am I pronouncing your, right, your name right, actually? Yes, you um, are, Gittens. Okay, let's start again. Hello, everyone. Today we have Greg Gittens, the author of the book, How, Di How to Think Strategically, in here. Um, welcome, Greg, and thank you for making time. Oh, well, thank you, Marcus. It's my pleasure to be here. So um, you wrote a really interesting book about strategy in particular. And let's start by, um, why don't you um, tell us a little bit about, maybe in three sentences or more, what made you write the book and what it is in general about, please. Okay, certainly. Well, um, I wrote the book with a big idea, and I think every book needs to have a big idea. And, and the big idea is that uh, strategic thinking is an individual comp competence. It's not a, another name for a process of strategic planning or, or something like that. And the idea came to me because I teach a seminar called How to Think Strategically. And certainly I've just been getting a lot of really good feedback from the audience uh, that says there's a need for that. You know, in a kind of a uniquely American view of things is sort of individualistic. And when I could say to an audience, I'm here to help you get promoted, uh, they found that to be something that just really, really resonated with them. So uh, as I researched, there's no other book out there like that with this idea. You will have other books that talk about strategic thinking, but mine's unique in that the idea that strategic thinking is an individual competence that can be developed uh, is unique. 
Wow, this sounds really interesting. Um, so in, in, in this sense, there is obviously sort of a bigger debate going on here and there in organizations about, um, you know, what to do around strategy and how to do the strategy and the old adage of reality eat strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to, to get your um, opinion on uh, when you say in your book that a successful strategy is, is placing smart bets. So how can organizations get better at accept, accepting that not all bets pay off? So it's about fear of failure, essentially. What's, what's, your, what's your thought on, on that? Yeah, uh, and that's cert certainly an important question to be asking. I, I think part of the short answer is to educate ourselves on more contemporary views of strategy that says strategy and goal setting are often confused. And that most managers come into organizations thinking about the goals they're trying to achieve, their aspirations and the goals, and they're determined to achieve those goals. And if for some reason they don't achieve the goal, it's somehow a personal failing on their part. Well, the more modern ideas of strategy really goes back even in 1952, the Nobel Prize in economics was awarded for something called modern portfolio management that says that there's a number of moving pieces in our investment portfolios, and we can't expect all of those investments to pay off. Some will pay, you know, will not do well, and some will do very well. So it, now in the more contemporary ways of thinking about strategy is what we want to do is create lots of options and lots of experiments. And we want to put them out into the marketplace and let the marketplace tell us what seems to be working and not working. And it just turns out that we're probably going to be more likely uh, successful across the aggregate of all of our options, of all of our ideas, by going out there and pushing it out to the edge, by being innovative. So we need to move towards safe to fail experiments, not fail safe design. And I think at the heart of that is that we have people carrying around some ideas that are rather, rather antiquated, that, that strategy is something about having a big idea and a mission and a vision, and then going out and achieving it through positive thinking. And, and I'm really saying it's a series of bets, it's a series of options, and that we're out exploring a territory, the future, which we don't know so well. And that, that oh, lines up with a lot sorry, of what we're... On. That lines up with a lot of what we're kind of talking to a number of people about, because whether it's design thinking or whether it's innovation thinking, it, it aligns up very much with that, that you need to be placing many bets. You need to be trying many things, running many experiments. You know, Amazon's out there doing a thousand new experiments a day or something ridiculous like that, because that's how they believe they're really going to, to proceed and to succeed in, in the long run. I still think that there's a lot of hesitance and a lot of reluctance on the individual level and you made the point that really your book is about strategy and strategic thinking at the individual competence level or as an individual skill and having the the correct mental environment and the correct corporate environment to allow for those multiple experiments, I think is really important. So, so do you think as well, when we uh, take that thought of uh, experimentation and the market actually uh providing the feedback or the insight or the data to to tell what works and what doesn't when we, when we take that thought and we expand it to say um because i think you you uh, you well don't think you wrote in your book that the idea of a consistently rational person is no longer accepted and that doesn't just come from the idea that you know that it's not just science telling us that i think we can see that everywhere that the whole notion of they were all reacting acting and reacting logically has been a bit fallen over which probably proves a bit of an issue for leaders, right? You said previously, um, or I uh, don't even see, I think I might have been in, doing a warm-up, that um, leaders or managers shouldn't just come in anymore and just say, oh, this and this and that. Because if we accept that they're not logical and they don't have all the facts and they can't have tested a thousand different things and know what comes back positively, then that 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 concept is 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 not valid anymore, right? So you know, uh, and 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 to point further in the book, you know, how can we best use storytelling and strategy? Are those things sort of connected um, in terms of how we would say um, the rational aspect 
is less important the storytelling maybe the qualitative rather than the quantitative aspect is more important so what are your thoughts on sort of that direction of of the development of what's needed these days yeah there's a lot there to to speak to so well, let's go to that point of, um, of of a consistently rational person is no longer accepted and and the the research is out there in psychology that tends to support that rational people make decisions in their own best interest and it's often that our mental machinery overrides us making decisions in our own best interest that we focus on you know on on the sweet stuff of dessert the things that are right in front of us the things that that make us feel good we tend to discount things that are long term payoffs you know in want to have my dessert now rather than than do that. So consequently, we're, there's just an enormous amount of research that points out that, that people don't often make decisions in their best interest. One example that I talked about in my book was about a, a CEO, an executive named Samuel Waxall, who was of a, of a major corporation. He had a PhD and all sorts of business training, yet he still made a decision about participating in the stock market and trading on insider information that led him to uh, be, be in prison because of trading on insider information. So the question comes up is, how can these brilliant CEO executives end up making short-term, bad, irrational decisions like that? And it's because of, of, of our internal biases. In this case, is we you know, are loss avoiders. We, we don't like bearing those kind of losses there. So an important part of strategic thinking is invoking what I call uh, the, the, the micro skill of metacognition, or I often talk about two shoulder angels, where one shoulder angel, angel is whispering in your ears, be sharp, pay attention, make good choices. And the other shoulder angel is saying, oh, you've been successful in the past. You're a good strategist. It's all going to work out. Don't worry about those things. And we have both, both of those voices you know, occurring in our mind. But a lot of times the shoulder angel of dullness, of laziness is the one that really prevails. So an important part of strategic thinking is, is the self-awareness of our, of our own thinking. Metacognition means the self-awareness and corrective action of what you're skilled at and not skilled at, what you know and what you don't know, and what you are feeling. And that's an area where it's one of the, I think, the real master skills that really, uh, really need to be in place. And it's one of the reasons that we need to have thinking partners, too. We just can't always trust ourselves. Yeah, and a, a real challenge with a lot of entrepreneurs is they're working by themselves. You know, they're, they're working in a very isolated environment and they don't have people to bounce those ideas off of and to check for their biases. And that, that can be a real challenge. So a lot of the really small businesses are lucky enough to have mentors or at least sometimes even a, a friendly customer to be able to discuss things with. Yeah, we're, we're all just wired to really focus on what comes to our mind immediately. And we're wired to focus on our own personal aspirations and what we think is important. And consequently, we, are, we tend to neglect ambiguity and neglect uncertainty and neglect a lot of things out there in the external market and just focus on our own aspirations. So that's something that I think is really, really important for individuals to, to work at. You, you, you make a point about ambiguity in the book a few times, and it, it literally makes me flinch every time I see the word. Because back in 2000, I was working for a company called Open Wave Systems, and I was a global solutions architect, which is a, a weighty title, but it really didn't mean that much. But my boss at one point in time, we were filling out a huge RFP for Vodafone. And we had a product, and RFP came out from Vodafone, and I was going through the Excel sheet, and you had to either mark compliant or non-compliant. And that's, that's the only two choices you had. You couldn't do anything kind of in the middle. And I marked non-compliant for about 100 different things. And my boss was like, Troy, you need to be more comfortable with ambiguity. You're just not very comfortable with it. You need to mark all of those as compliant and realize how you're going to justify it down the line. And I was like, oh, that makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I start off the book by saying, what is one factor that is essential in the understanding of strategy yet is overlooked by most people? And the answer is ambiguity. So ambiguity is about the multiple meanings. And, it's, and this is a key point now I'm getting to on strategy. Strategy is about sensing and sense making. 
So sensing means to pay attention to the world around us, pay attention to all those weak signals out in the marketplace coming from customers and, and other places, and then trying to make sense out of them. And Marcus, you asked me about storytelling a little while ago, and, and the way I think of storytelling is that it is a tool for sense making. It is a way that we take these signals that are in front of us that we construct some kind of story around it. The story that I like to think about when we're talking about strategy is it's a variation of the epic or heroic story where you have someone in their comfort zone, doing, that means they're doing their day-to-day -day work, that's what I call operational thinking, you're producing and doing the job responsibility, but then they're called on to cross the threshold and to enter a special world. So it's just like, you know, if we're watching Star Wars and Lou Skywalker has to leave and go off on this, this epic journey that he's going to go on. The, 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 the place we're going in strategy, the special world that we're traveling to, and it's a world that we're going to be tested in. It's going to test our character and, 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 and test our resolve and test our, our courage. It's the special world of strategy. And in this process of, of testing, we are provided with the elixir. We are provided with insights, and I call insights the secret sauce of strategy. We can bring those insights back we, to the to our ordinary world, and we can use that as in a way to reconstruct the direction that we really want to go. So stories are, are valuable tools because they help us with the sensing and the sense making. And I like to think about it again in terms of this sort of, sort of heroic quest, not so much the way that many data scientists look at it as they'll say, oh, an insight is just an interesting bit of information and, and a data story is just some little trend or something here. To me, an insight is a, is a revelation of a new and better understanding of the way that things work. And, and, and I think one of the important landmarks of strategic thinking is the landmark of insights. If you want to be a strategic thinker and you're not sure what to start, remember that you're on a journey to find an insight. You're on a journey to try to find a better explanation of the reality of the world that's out there. So those are the kind of things that get into ambiguity. Those are the kind of things that are, they don't come to you nicely packaged in a spreadsheet, and nor does a template-driven approach to strategy help you out in that area as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how there's quite some relations between, um, when you just said that, so that, that brings me back like 20 years ago into my MA, so that I did over at Royal College in something called computer related design and later called design interactions. But the, the essence of the course essentially was to bring sort of art, design and technology together and look at uh, human centered research. And a lot of artifacts or tools we were using was storytelling. So we did little video examples or something based on some of the designs and idea ideas um, we had. And the whole point was not just to design the thing that we thought is the solution, but actually the context and explain how it is going to look, sit and function in reality. So often we had, you know, we used each other, me and my colleagues used each other as actors to film each other using a mock-up piece of cardboard and seeing how this actually works. And it was all based on real existing behaviors and then just playing it through. And just by playing it through, you get a good idea. Does it work? Is anyone actually would anyone anyone actually do that? Would that actually be happening like that? And you get a really good feel for it because you're all human beings. And the second you're outside of an office or a creative glass box, you're quickly realizing that yeah, that's probably not going to catch on, right? So and 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 today, twenty years later, in service design, there's there's similar artifacts where you play things through with people, and just the fact of mocking things up and playing things through, basically experimenting it in a particular way brings reality very quickly into the presence of the decision-making process, right? So people, and it's interesting to see, and I wonder if you have any thought on um, the way strategy is executed today in many places and the way we maybe should be doing it um, on an individual level. When you say, is it maybe that everyone should know a bit more about strategy but be able to, and therefore, be able to explore reality more is that sort of a little bit what you're saying and should we therefore know you know how how would we integrate those pieces into a day work day-to-day -day work or in teams um so do you think everyone should become a bit more of a strategist essentially 
Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that last part. You touched on a lot of really important points there, but but yeah, why are you doing that? That, <laughs> that, that? that every individual, every person can and should be thinking strategically. If it's not on behalf of their employer and their organization, your career certainly is something that benefits from strategic thinking. The decisions that you make about your personal investments and, and so forth uh, are, are certainly there. So I argue for a very broad, democratic, everybody should have the ability to think strategically. Uh, but it's not to say that everybody should have a voice in the organizational strategy setting process. But somehow we need to have a way for uh, helping those people to uh, to let their voices be heard and to participate in the sensing and sense making that I, I talked about uh, a little bit earlier. You know, you mentioned in your question a little bit about context, which I think is incredibly important for strategy, that as, as strategists, what we want to do is increase the amount of time that we're spending looking outside the walls of our organizations and the things that we're familiar and more into areas of, of uncertainty and ambiguity and so forth and paying attention to the weak signals that we have so that we can respond to the changing context that we're in. You talked a little bit about designing tools, and, and here's how I define strategy. I, I think strategy is a specialized tool, and, and that would imply then that we use it in some situations and other situations we don't use it. Strategy is a specialized tool. It's used to advance the interest of the organization, and it's done by managing issues that have broad long-term impact. So you look around and say, what are all these things happening out here in the external world that could affect me or us uh, when I look broadly and when I start to think a little bit more long term? And that's what I think strategy is. It's essentially a form of problem solving that says I've got to look outside and I've got to be aware of everything that's happening in the environment around me. And through that, it leads me to ask just a real simple question. What's the biggest challenge that our organization faces that we can do something about? And getting the collective of the organization to talk about what are the biggest challenges that we can face that we can do something about, I think is one of the most important questions that can be asked inside the organization. And I'll contrast that with what more commonly happens is, which is, what are our goals? What do we aspire to? What problems do we want to fix? Let's get to it. And that leads then to, to, to the last part of your question about strategy execution. I don't think that strategy can be thought of as simply an idea or a goal. But again, that's an area that's frequently confused along the way. And so what we have is people blaming strategy execution when the real problem is in the design of the strategy. So what I say to people is, number one, Give me good strategy and not bad strategy. Number two, give me adequate resources. You know, perhaps you've heard the saying that a, a vision without resources is a hallucination. And resources are scarce in organizations, so it takes difficult decisions about where are we going to invest and disinvest. The third one is I need some good leadership. I mean, I need individuals who can pull people along on the journey, help them to deal with that ambiguity, help them to place intelligent bets, help them to have the courage to step out of their comfort zone and to go off on this journey into the future. And the last thing I need is a little bit of luck. So I, I think given that strategy execution is not hard if I have good and not bad strategy, adequate resources, uh, sufficiently good leadership, and a little bit of luck. I think it's really nicely packaged the way you've done that. I think the other thing that um, I really kind of caught on was the second half of the phrase, what is the biggest challenge to our organization that we can do something about? And it's that assessing, can we actually affect change? Can we actually do something about this so we don't wind up kind of you know, howling against the wind, as it were? Yeah, so, so true. I, and another micro skill of strategic thinking is pragmatism. And, and that's the understanding of how the world really works, uh, understanding what is feasible. And certainly we know we can push the edges and we can push the boundaries and, and people are generally 
more capable of accomplishing things than they're willing to give themselves credit to. But I think one of the big challenges then in strategy is for, for managers, for executives to make the decision. This is what we believe this major challenge is. And then they start to make some strategic decisions that say, we're going to focus here and we're not going to focus over here. Uh, good strategy is really dependent upon focus to, to give us the leverage to, to pivot into the areas that we need to do. But especially for larger and more established organizations, it's really tough to say no to things that are already underway. Uh, I, I often talk to people who are managing projects and I'll ask them, how many of you work in organizations that have too many projects for your resource base? And inevitably, every hand goes up. Every hand goes up, which tells me that if there are too many projects, they're not doing a good job of focus and priorities. And, and I'll, here's my final point then is a good strategy may hurt someone's feelings. If every project <laughs> is important to someone someplace in the organization, unfortunately, we're going to have to go forward and say, can't do that project anymore. Can't do that project anymore. And can't do that project anymore because we need those resources to be put over here where we can get more leverage. Yeah, I wrote a, a blog post that was talking about the fact that before a project starts, no one can say yes. And once a project starts, no one can say stop. You know, it's, it's really, really difficult because once you've committed resource to it and the organization has gotten the kind of momentum running behind them, nobody wants to pull the brakes and say, okay, we're going to stop doing this project because that would imply failure. And before but that, nobody wants to take the risk. Yeah, and, and, and we love talking about failure, don't we, in the context of pot potential failure. And it's one of those things that you know gets gets me to a question as well that I will have in a second but just a little anecdote there there, there then and there again I mean obviously Troy and me we work on fairly large projects that you know like programs rather you know which include multiple projects really where the size of the investment and the effort and the commitment of the company that's finally put into black ink is hard to pull back and I think often those big programs are they're kind of right, actually, you know. They do them for the right reasons. They might not do them in a good way, but they do them for the right reasons, right? And then the problem is that you have often what I call hygiene factors. You often have a big program set up, and the major hygiene factors are just not there, you know. So there's gaps already, and in theory, that would be um, a, a reason to pull back a big program, but that rarely gets taken taken care of. And it's hard to measure and it's hard to, to know when measurements come back. But if I talk about um, smaller projects, I think it's totally vital to be able to really turn around or, or pivot or something. Because when I look, for example, at um, big projects I did over at BT, um, where we had three pilots and two of them came back with insights that just showed that we needed to pivot. And we could actually. So that was one of the few cases I saw where project and the, the leadership actually said yeah data looks good let's stop that uh, we need to do something else what are we going to do with the resources well we got more than one insight we found that this is a completely wrong investment but we also found a big hole in there in the ecosystem let's fill that hole while we're here right so that was brilliant that was just where you, where you and it's really rare to see that the measurements are right there the insights that are coming back are getting recognized and there are enough and a process potentially is in place to say well strategically we still have the money we still want to do that and improve and it still sits in the same area it's, it's supported by the same strategic pillars which then potentially goes into the conversation of teams knowing about the strategic pillars which i think there's a mckinsey study saying that most most employees don't even know what the strategic pillars of the companies are. But that's just about communication. It's not what I want to ask about. The main question for me is this. If we are starting to have better or more teams being able to gather insights because there's more strategic thinking present in individuals in the teams and insights come back, how do we close the gap between the teams on the ground, close to the customer, and the senior leadership um, and the information that should flow back so that we can justify or that we can more put into place the agility for pivots and those kind of things to happen or, or just that the information feeds back up to the leadership and the leadership can adjust the overall strategy and eventually maybe say you know what the program needs to change needs to 
pick a different direction or something like that. Do you have any thoughts on how to close that gap between maybe the top line leadership strategy and then the on the ground team insights that are coming back? Because I, I feel there's a big gap in a lot of programs I see where communication data doesn't really flow all the way back. It's just temporary, but it doesn't really get added on or improves the overall strategy. What's what's your thought on that? Yeah, uh, that's something that I think I did a nice job in my book of trying to provide, uh, I hate to use the word roadmap, but sort of a framework for thinking about these things. So um, first off, you know, in large organizations, there's a lot of voices you know, and a lot of ideas and a lot of data floating around. And, and I am optimistic that Technology can provide some answers there. If we're saying the problem we're trying to solve is how do we take all of this data about the external world and insights and these kind of things and bring them together into some sort of packageable, manageable kind of story, I think there's technology out there that can help us do that. Um, so, so the general approach that I I have, and, and first off, let's go to writing. I, I provide what I think is a really nifty little approach for writing strategy and getting it down to a couple of pages long. It, it, it involves five elements. The first element is simply stating what your interests are as an organization. It might be to enrich your shareholders. It might be to advance uh, environmental protection. It might be uh, justice. It could be any of those kind of things. And we see that those kind of interests are changing in contemporary society. So sometimes those can be an impetus to strategy. Okay, the next part, and this is the, a really important part, is to say, what are your beliefs about the external world? Do you believe that the future is going to be one of more pandemics and more ramifications of the current pandemic that we're in? What do you see as changes in, in various technologies? Uh, transportation, food technology, that list can go on and on and on. Well, there's a lot of beliefs out there. So the challenge within the organization is to get these individual beliefs moved into some sort of collective belief. And we want to make sure that we're leaving some room for the people that are unorthodox, that maybe can more keenly perceive small, weak signals and pockets of the future better than anyone else. So this is a place for dialogue and deliberation is what I call it. It's a place for, for skillful conversation about what do we believe to be true about the external world, both present and projecting into the future, and how are we going to react to that? And then that brings us to the third part, and I mentioned this earlier, the core challenge. The question is, what's the biggest challenge that our organization faces that we can do something about? And again, that's sort of a belief that we have about what we're going to focus our organization's energies upon. The fourth point is where we have to start making decisions. And this is where I would use the phrase strategic decisions. Strategic decisions are rather, rather small decisions. They stand alone and they influence downstream tactical decisions. This is where top management needs to be involved. They have to say, we're going to do this and not that, even if other people are telling them that their pet project, their pet pony, whatever it may be, uh, might be sacrificed and that would be bad. They have to make that hard decision to say, we're going to invest here and disinvest there. And that's essentially what a strategic decision is. And that's the fourth part of the template. And the fifth part of the template is to say, how do our tech our tactical decisions adapt to that. Well, I say that you can get those five pieces, interest, beliefs, core challenge, strategic decisions, and tactical adaptations down to a couple pieces of paper, uh, printed on a couple pieces of paper, and share that with the organization. And now all of a sudden, you, you should have a better understanding of what the organization is trying to do. One of the communication problems is, is that we just bury people with these hundred page long documents that are called strategy that are usually in some sort of PowerPoint design that are just full of aspirations and goals and actions and things. Again, back to things that people wish would happen that you that it's hard for the average person to look at this and really make sense out of all of it. One of the things that I've done as a consultant for my clients is I've come in and I've looked at these 100, 200 page long strategy documents and pick, gone through and picked out and here's the important things to look at. And so obviously people are getting just really uh, confused by all the noise and 
one of the challenge of strategic thinking is to pick the signal out of the noise. So those are, I guess, a few things that I would say about you know, one of the challenges of how we have people out on the front line that are dealing with customers and technologies and things. And then we have people that are, you know, our, our senior executives who obviously have to have a role in guiding and shaping policy. And somehow we need a way to bring those whole, those things together. And I think part of the answer is in technology. Uh, a lot of the answer is in clearer concepts of what strategy is and what strategy isn't. And then the empowering of people by creating more strategic thinkers at all levels of the organization. I, I think the book has done a really, really good job at clarifying the language. So you start off, you know, saying these are specifically the words that we're going to use, and these are the context that we're going to use them. And then you layer on specific frameworks, like you just laid out how you can actually write a strategy down in a couple of pages rather than a 200 page PowerPoint deck that goes into a folder and nobody ever looks at ever again. Um, at the beginning of the show, you were talking about the fact that a lot of people, or the reason that you started the book was you were doing workshops. And the, the value proposition to the people who attend the workshops is, I can help you get promoted by learning how to think more strategically. I think it's a really strong value proposition. Um, we've also talked kind of glancingly about the idea that not everybody should have a seat at the, the global strategy, but everyone should think strategically. Sometimes I find people in the organization say, well, they really don't care what I think because all those decisions are being made so far above me. Why should I even bother? How do we get people invited and excited to start doing strategic thinking, even within their own department, within their own leadership, within their own division? Yeah, awesome. Good, good things there. Well, well first off, um, we can use that same question I offered earlier. What's the core challenge we face? And we could ask that question right in our um, right within our project teams, our departments, our divisions, or whatever. And I think some really fruitful conversations would come out of that. Um, I think another point to, to, to recognize too, and this goes back to kind of like the rudiments of what strategy is. Corporate strategy is a discussion around the question of what businesses do we want to be in and what businesses do we not want to be in. And so certainly for really large organizations, that's a very important part of the discussion. When we get down to what we call business strategy, this is how do I win in my chosen market? How do I create the superior value proposition? And you can take that same kind of thinking all the way down into smaller and smaller parts of the organization. If I'm managing a product line, uh, how can I win in my chosen product line? How can I provide a value proposition that's superior to the competitor's value proposition? So th the kinds of things, the micro skills I'm talking about in strategic thinking, feed out and play out in so many different kinds of ways. Plus, let's also know that you know many individuals are often doing not-for-profits, uh, work for charities and uh, community groups and those kind of things. And boy, if anybody needs some good strategy work, it's the people you know in our communities and local governments and school boards and, and all those kind of things. So there's plenty of opportunities to, to, to apply strategic thinking to help an organization that you care about come up with good and not bad strategy. The other point that I, I want to throw out here, though, is that maybe not everybody wants to think strategically, can think strategically. Maybe it's just too difficult. I mean, I do believe it's hard work. I do believe that it, it involves using our imagination to think about things that perhaps we'd rather not think about, to you know, try to imagine what the future would be like, to try to understand threats and, and, and as, as well as opportunities. And um, just the ability to pick up weak signals and know what is a weak signal and which ones to ignore and which ones not, the signal to noise ratio. And our, and our cultures enforce a, a certain kind of orthodoxy upon individuals. And, and many people say it's dangerous to be a strategic thinker. You're, you're sticking out because it's unconventional, it's unorthodox, it's, it's heretical, it's, it's iconoclastic, and those kind of things. And they perceive that as, as being a risk to themselves or a risk to their comfort zone. And I get that. 
And, and so one of the choices that people have to make along the way is that it requires a certain amount of courage to be unconventional, to try to look at things in a different kind of way, and that you're going to have people teasing you or being sarcastic, like, what do you want to do it that way for? And to have enough self-assurance in your, in, in your own ideas to say, I see something differently here, and this different thing I see might be important to all of us. Marcus? Well, Marcus was going to ask the last question. I don't know what's happened to Marcus. Marcus muted himself. Ah. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was literally just going on for about half a minute here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, I want to pick up on something you said, and I think it's quite, quite um topical for sure you know um we all probably been in lots of projects where people weren't brave enough or you know when when didn't think they could stick out and say hey let's do something else let's do it differently let's maybe do something that's non-intuitive but might be right we're now living in a covid world you know the map has just been thrown out of the window um there's a brand new context for most things now um we don't have a choice anymore to not do something new or different. We're often forced to do something different because the thing that was there yesterday is just literally gone. So in that sense, um, I'd like to have your thoughts on when we compare efficiency and effectiveness as to different approaches of what you can do. And I would describe efficiency as you stick to what you've done before, you just make it better, right? Or effectiveness where you go, no, I'm going to consider anything in order to get to a better place. I might throw some of the old stuff out of the window. I might keep some of it. I don't know, but at least I consider it. So I'll try something else. Where do you see us in this new world to stick with? Is it generally a better idea, therefore, where you would say, let's just fully focus on effectiveness or stick with efficiency? Is, is, is efficiency becoming really an outdated focal area? What, what's your thought on yeah, that? Yeah, not at all. I remember well being taught this rule by uh, Brad Goldstein, who's one of the big thinkers in, in new product development. And, and his rule is this, measure effectiveness first and efficiency second. And it's always been kind of a guiding idea for me. So, so effectiveness is more about having impact rather than how well you do that. And I think that's where strategy comes in. Uh, I think a, a strategy that is after a good idea uh, maybe doesn't have to be executed that well, as long as you are getting into a space so that you know, what maybe people call the first mover advantage is to get in that space where you can keep learning. You, you learn your way into what you're doing. Inefficiency is about operating your existing model. And it's certainly a really important thing to do is to, uh, to, to operate your existing model. This brings me back to something I touched on real lightly uh, earlier, which is I describe a map of operational thinking and a map of strategic thinking. And, and, and then the strategic thinking map has three major landmarks on it. I mentioned uh, insights earlier. Another important landmark is the idea of the future. And the third is the core challenge. So basically, the idea is if you want to be, think strategically, Number one, think about the future. Number two, think about the core challenge. And number three, search for insights. And that's kind of like your land landmarks that you navigate towards. Now, the operational thinking map, here, here's what I call the five P's of operational thinking. First off, there is an aspiration for productivity. And I think that's where the efficiency idea really comes in. An aspiration for productivity, an aspiration for predictability, and an aspiration for perfection. No errors. Okay, so so uh, 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 productivity, predictability, perfection. Then we add to that process because the things that organizational process does is it removes ambiguity. It helps the members of the process focus on producing an output at low error rates at a prescribed rate. It allows you to predict what's going on. 
And that's the fourth P is process. And the fifth P is the present. And I argue then is that our mental energy is so collected by the first four P's of productivity and perfection and predictability and process that we don't have any more mental energy left over to think about anything than other than what's right in front of us, the present. And so an important thing that we have to do within the as individuals is that we have to say, it's good to be efficient. It's good to have a good, well-running business model and good operations. But maybe I need to step back and allocate some time to strategic thinking. Maybe I need to, to put some effort into saying, what's the core challenge? What's going to be different in the future? Um, where, where are the insights that I might be able to follow? And I think that kind of gets into the uh, one of the crux problems that we have in existing organizations is that people are just so busy, but they're so busy being operational. I'm hoping I'm giving people a tool to recognize within themselves that they, they have to make that choice to spend some t attention to think strategically and not just let it be part of an annual planning cadence that happens within the organization. That sounds great. I think it's a really good. I'm looking a bit at the time. I think those are great words to wrap up to, actually. There's so much in this book. It's really lovely. And I think there's a there's a there's quite a relevance in general, maybe not for just for strategy, but definitely for strategy, to bring the thinking of why are we doing things and how are we doing things and how how that kind of thinking can contribute for to companies doing a better job into every position essentially i think there's a couple of thoughts and trends generally around new capabilities across organizations in order to tackle the future better and it sounds like strategy is surely one of them that should be considered having said that thank you so much greg for your time this was very enlightening very lovely and uh yeah thank you thank you for your wise words well, well, thank you, Marcus and, and Troy, as well. Uh, you're very welcome. I enjoyed this conversation, and those were some really thought-provoking questions that you uh, asked me. So it's my pleasure to be here. Have thank a good you. rest of your day, and thanks again. Okay. Cheers. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.